Welcome to Something to Talk About. It's Politics Day, and we'll be getting in touch with David Harrison in just a moment. I do want to thank our sponsor for Something to Talk About, Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island. They have assisted an independent living and a vibrant memory care community up on Rolling Bay along the campus there. They also have day stay, respite, and um, other programs. You can call 206 594 1010, or you can email Ashley C at fieldstonecommunities.com, or just check out their website, fieldstonecommunities.com, or come by for a tour. Uh, just go around the corner down from uh, Falk, and you will see them there. Uh, we would like to also acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. The um, Suquamish have lived on these lands and waters uh, against the Salish Sea since time immemorial, and we are learning from their stewardship. We honor them and appreciate their hospitality. And so David Harrison, who is a blogger and former professor of ideas involved with public policy and an avid student of these difficult times for democracy joins us once again. Uh, David, you usually divide us up into three topics. So what are we going to do today? So today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening with uh, Ukraine funding and the military defense uh, bill, which is the only thing that's going to happen between now and Christmas. Then we'll talk about George Santos's uh, unceremonious fall and what it has to do with uh, the Republican slim majority in the House. And then we'll end up with our usual topic, Nikki Haley, and where the Republicans are going and what it might have to do with the with the Democrats. So, so uh, welcome, Christina from the East, and uh, let's let it fly. So it's uh, the other day I went to uh, uh, Cindy and Sheila's uh, concert, gorgeous concert that Amabile put on, and I was leaving, and three separate veteran islanders took me aside separately, after and after saying what a great concert it was of Amabile, um, they confessed a great amount of dread with regard to the American political situation, uh, more than they had, would have expressed any time, basically, in, since 2020. And I, 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 do, I certainly have my share of anxiety, but I don't, I don't have dread. I feel like uh, these are complex and difficult times, and there's a lot of division uh, in America, but I think uh, that there's enough real estate agents in Dubuque and pharmacists and in uh, Columbia, South Carolina to see us forward. I, I think people want the Republic to stand, and I think it will. Um, so let's start with, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, wants more money for arms from us. And a lot of us felt when McCarthy went down that uh, Democrats must have a plan because they wouldn't have, they could have saved uh, Kevin McCarthy and Kevin McCarthy had previously uh, been involved with uh, funding for, the, for Ukraine. Um, so to this day, it's puzzling exactly how that money's going to be secured. And, and here's the complication. When you're Mike Johnson and you're Speaker of the House and Joe Biden what got to be president with and control the House for two years, um, you're looking for leverage situations and there aren't that many. You know, when you control just the House, Democrats hold the White House and the Senate. You're looking for something that Joe Biden wants so that you can get something that you want. That's your leverage. And that hasn't worked very well for the Republicans with regard to the budget continuing resolution. And Joe Biden doesn't want more money for 
infrastructure or COVID or China competitiveness because uh, the the house is 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 so split. So Mike uh, Johnson, has, a speaker, has been waiting for something to try and bargain, and funding for Ukraine is it. So there is going to be funding for Ukraine, and the only issue left really is what will be traded uh, to get those votes having to do with border security. So on one end is uh, Senate Democrats. Uh, they have in their military defense $100 billion package, money for Israel, uh, money for Ukraine, money for all sorts of weapon systems as usual, and a little money for border security. And so Schumer put that up knowing that, that uh, McConnell wouldn't give him enough votes to pass it and knowing uh, that the House wouldn't agree with it. It was a starter. And the idea was that Zelensky was going to come on some kind of uh, uh, streamed plea and help move the Senate Republicans along because 25 of them are big Zelensky fans. That didn't happen. McConnell got mad, but uh, they're negotiating as we speak. They want to do it before they go home. The Senate wants a bill to serve up to the House, and what it will include is funding for Ukraine, funding for Israel, and more border security funding than uh, than Schumer offered up or, or Biden has offered up. And Here's the rub. For McConnell, it's just about reinforcements at the border, and he would not insist on fundamental policy changes with regard to asylum. But that's what Mike, um, I keep on calling him Mike Thompson, Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson, yeah. Mike Johnson um, called, told the House Republican Conference. That's the hill they're going to die on. That's really a stupid thing to say. He wants the hills for him to die on as transformational major policy changes with regard to asylum seekers. So basically, the administration has a lot of discretion in terms of releasing somebody in the United States while they're seeking asylum, and in some cases, uh, uh, waiving uh, some conditions and such. And uh, Republicans in the House want to fundamentally change that. What James Langford, the very conservative senator of Oklahoma, said the other day is very apt. Any bill that would take get all the Republicans and no Democrats in the House can't get 60 votes in the Senate. So uh, something's got to give. And um, since the House Republicans don't have much leverage. What we'll give is, is uh, when in doubt, spend money. So there'll be some major money reinforcing uh, border capacity, some modest policy shifts on asylum, and then some money for, for Ukraine and, and, uh, and Israel. And that's the way it'll turn out. But that will mean that, as usual, uh, Republican House leadership won't have enough votes. And so uh, along will come uh, Hakeem Jeffries. And if Schumer and Biden want it, those Democrats in the House will give the Republicans the 70 or, votes, 70 or so votes they need. And we'll have a compromise that will keep members from having to bear the responsibility if on some bad day, uh, Putin gets recharged and drives his tanks toward Kiev. So that's what they're worried about. There, as many criticisms as they have, of, as many non-globalists as there are that are Republicans, and even a few uh, Putin lovers, God help them, uh, they're not gonna have on their record that they pulled support for Ukraine. 
they're just trying to hold up the Democrats so they could get somebody for it. And uh, and so that's what, in my view, is is go going to happen. The, the fear uh, for Republicans is they don't want to be held responsible for any bromances they have with Putin. Putin. Uh, it's all about what they can extract with regard to the border without doing themselves political damage by exposing uh, Ukraine. And for Democrats, they take incoming all the time um, on border security. The American people, it's a, uh, for Democrats, you know, that's not a majority voting issue right now. Americans are concerned about uh, 8,000 or so uh, um, illegal uh, transfers across the border each day. So, uh, so the Democrats are vulnerable. They'll give in on some border security. Biden won't let them make monumental changes in policy. It, Israel will get some money. Ukraine will get some money. And they'll all go home. This might not happen by Christmas. If it doesn't happen by Christmas, Joe Biden already knows which Western allies can send money while we're not sending money. And he has a little flexibility. You know, they've sounded the alarm, but that doesn't mean they they don't have this or that that they could do for Zelensky with an uh, existing authorization and appropriations. So uh, that's my uh, 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 vote for for how they all get together. And you notice yet again, the House uh, majority is so small that between now and November, there's almost nothing that they're gonna be able to do without having some votes from Democrats. So they're not gonna be cutting any outright deals or even wink wink deals. But the speaker knows what the minority leader needs, and he's not going to pass anything like what uh, 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 Mike Thompson has advocated. He's, he's maybe a hill he's going to die on, but they're not going to fundamentally change United States policy on asylum. But they will do a lot of border stuff, and then they'll then they'll have it done. Read. Well, so Mike Johnson, Johnson. Um, Mike Johnson, is this the hill he's going to die on? Are they going to be able to keep? Is he? Are, are the Republicans going to continue to wash through uh, speakers between now and November? You know, there is a member of Congress uh, from Pennsylvania or someplace named Mike Thompson. It's just he's just not speaker. Um, no, they're not going to kick him out. Whatever he does. Because they had that awful experience, um, and they realized that there's nobody that could be elected, uh, he's he's got to get a j out of jail free uh, card. What they're going to do rather than kick him out is make it impossible for him to be speaker. So we already have that lesson. The most benign appropriations to the law <coughs> was House transportation was transportation. And it fell, and they couldn't get a rule to debate it on the floor because Northeast Republicans didn't want any Amtrak cuts. And then there was another uh, appropriations bill that had a little uh, messing around uh, uh, on choice that the moderates didn't like. So um, there, it's just they're really out of the ability to get a majority on anything. So the test will always be, here, here's how it works with Hakeem Jeffries. Um, if they, if the most conservative Democrat wanted to vote with the Republicans on, on something, he or she would not do that without going to see Jeffries. And they would say, I want to be released uh, to vote my conscience on this. And Jeffries would say, we have a plan. They know they need our votes. Don't do that. I, I don't want people uh, randomly 
passing things that the Republican caucus wants. So basically the decision maker on whether uh, 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 Mike Johnson gets, uh, Mike Thompson gets uh, support, uh, Mike Johnson gets support is, uh, is Hakeem Jeffries. And he won't buy anything that that is fundamental change in asylum policy. So I think he's safe till next November. And I think we could well, we meaning Democrats could well lose the Senate and lose the White House and win the House. It's just when you think of what else is happening, you've got 16 members who are Republicans who won in districts that Biden won. You've got five seats or so Democrats will will uh, get because of redistricting in the South. And you have the fact of three or four seats that Democrats will get back in New York because the New York Democratic Party was absent a year ago. So uh, it's looking, it looks very good for for uh, Hakeem Jeffries to, to be speaker. And, and to answer your question, Reed, no, there's nothing they're going to do to kick him out, only because in election year, they know they don't have anybody else that could get a majority. They selected him because he's a nice guy, basically, or purportedly he's a nice guy. Other questions before we move on? So we'll establish once and for all that the speaker's name is not Mike Thompson, that's Mike Johnson. So uh, unless he changes his name. Uh, so we all followed- We'll, we'll uh, let him know that you might appreciate that. What? We'll let him know that you might appreciate yeah, that. Right. It'll make me more accurate. Um, and it's funny because as he, you know, he was in the house, he wasn't known until he was selected and, and that was awesome to his advantage. Um, so uh, th these things are all related because the George Santos thing paid, played out in a certain way uh, because the margins are so close. So now you've got 70 Republicans voting with Democrats to throw out George Santos, who should have been thrown out the first minute after he was elected. So now you've got what what did Republicans who didn't vote to throw him out say? They didn't say this is a great man who was, it's not like the November 6th election. They didn't say this is a pretend thing and George Santos didn't do anything wrong. They didn't say we made it up and that's fake news. They just said it's a, a, a precedent to throw somebody out without them having been convicted of a felony. Um, what they would have said is, we're not throwing anybody out when we only have a four vote majority. That's really what they meant because they created a house ethics committee that's, uh, that adjudicates well as, as well as investigates. That's what it does. It isn't there to as a fact finding mission. That's why members don't want to be on it. The worst assignment to get is how that's ethics, because all you do is piss people off. Jim McDermott, some of you remember Jim McDermott, was on house ethics for a long time, and he didn't want to be on house ethics. He told me that, and uh, I believe him. So uh, uh, what happened is everybody on house ethics did their subpoenas and their investigation, and they found that he should be expelled. And the primary reason uh, that Republicans don't, a lot of Republicans did not want to expel him is they'll lose that seat now. Santos got 54%, but there's not some New York Republican who's going to be able to withstand the fury of those voters <clears throat> after getting snookered. So so they didn't want to lose that seat. So here's where the untruths were prevalent. They said that only two congressmen have been expelled since the Civil War, and they expelled three because they were fighting for the South, which that was disapproved of. So uh, 
it's it's true that in modern times only two congressmen before Santos had been <clears throat> expelled, and that after felonies, including uh, Tom, followed the career of uh, trafficant from from Ohio, and he was nice. thrown out after uh, corruption, and so was a member uh, before that. But here's a story. In modern times, maybe last 50 years, 20 uh, congressmen have resigned when they were under criminal investigation. They just don't wait to be expelled. So this idea that that it's an extreme punishment, all, the, all 20 of them were being threatened by the ethics committee. They just chose to spend more time with their family and and such and such, but they were under equal challenge. So it's it's just very misleading to say uh, we're setting a precedent because we only should be expelling felons. The issue is whether the House should have uh, its own standard for who's suitable to serve. And the wrong way, the thing wrong with the felony conviction as a standard is it would take uh, forever to secure it. I, I support the House having its own standard with regard to it being used frequently, it requires a two thirds vote to expel someone. So I'm not worried about that. So David, where do, yes. How do we get rid of Jim Jordan? <laughs> go right Honest now. To God to question. His, go right now to his district and start your campaign. <laughs> You're not gonna expel. There's no chance that you're going to expel Jim Jordan. Uh, and besides, I mean, is he the, well, maybe he is. I was about to say, is he the biggest jerk you've ever seen in Congress? Maybe that's, that's a good point. Close, close. I, when I worked on, I worked on the Hill, and there was a otherwise pretty interesting Senator Arlen Specter, who was a Republican who voted both ways, worked across the aisle. Smart man, impossible to work for. Just absolutely impossible. Staff hated working for him because he was he he'd had so much anger as a part of his deal. And when his chief of staff uh, left him, she left a note on his desk that said, "Life is too short to spend another minute of it with you." <laughs> so there are people in Congress that are hard to get along with. So now. Uh, Kevin McCarthy's going to resign. Some say, why did it take you so long? It's sort of a, you know, Boehner resigned, Paul Ryan resigned, Eric Kanner resigned. Uh, so it's kind of a tradition once you reach the pinnacle of power and they stick a finger in your eye to not stay. Um, and, uh, and so now their effective majority will be uh, two votes. So what you're saying is, is there a chance Democrats could take back the House? First, there'd be a question as whether you would want it in a tie, but I don't think so because, uh, and I'll explain why. For one, we're not going to win Kevin McCarthy's seat, so it will go back to three. We'll win George Kanner's, George Kanner, we'll win uh, George Santos' seat, but Kevin McCarthy got 64% of the vote. That's a solid Republican seat. I don't think we're going to win it. So then other things are going to happen. There's a member from Ohio uh, who's going to run Youngstown State University. So he's going to reach sign. But there's a member, uh, there's a uh, member from Pennsylvania, a Democrat, who's going to resign in February because he's mad at the Republicans and he doesn't like Congress anymore. So I just don't see us picking up three deaths or three or four resignations more than the Republicans, um, more Republicans than Democrats. I will say, um, as a historical note, some of you were around when this exact thing happened. In 2001, uh, uh, the Republicans had uh, a one-vote majority in the Senate. And Jim Jeffords of Vermont uh, switched from being a Republican to being an independent and flipped the Senate 
including all the senior staff positions. So there was just absolute shock on the hill. And lo and behold, right after he flipped, the Democrats named him head of the Senate Education Committee. So there was a reason for him to flip. But it was an odd situation because he was reelected in Vermont then as an independent. There isn't any member of Congress who could flip from R to D and survive. So the only politically, so the only person who would do it would be somebody who was in their last term and was so mad at his caucus or her caucus that they would do it. And if it was a tie, maybe that would happen. But I, I think uh, uh, that it's not going to happen. So what are we going to get? We're going to get um, almost no legislative action in the House all next year. They have to have a budget. After that, it'll be just what the Speaker's done so far, try and get votes on symbolic resolutions. They might even have the votes to do a, a more serious impeachment inquiry, which is bizarre. Every time they do one of those things and they squeeze their 20 most moderate members to vote along with them, they're just serving those members up uh, for uh, a dangerous time running for re-election. So every symbolic vote to set the Republican agenda is terrifying to swing district members. So bring it on. But in terms of meaningful legislation happening next year, uh, it's not going to happen. And there's nothing. It's only going to be just what I explained with regard to to uh, Israel and uh, Ukraine. It's only going to be something that somebody thinks must happen. And then there's where the leverage is. You may wonder how it was possible for Pelosi to maintain discipline and pass things without the wars that the Republicans are having. How was she able to do that? And she's a very effective speaker, but it was because there was a reward system. So House Republican leadership, they don't have a way to reward people that vote with them because what they're voting on isn't going to pass. And they don't go control the White House, so they're not going to get some special treatment from an agency on their pet solar energy project. So all the time, uh, Pelosi was keeping the Democratic majority in the early days of, of uh, Biden's term. She had an administration to deal with, and that's a huge difference. If the House Republican leadership had basically what they had to bargain when McCarthy made it was enhanced efforts to kill McCarthy. I mean, that's what he gave them. Yes, uh, if you only will vote for me, I'll make it easier for you to kill me. And that's what happened. Questions, thoughts on the slim majority before we move on to the um, David, uh, Michael Deal, I'm in a reading group and we've been reading a lot of stuff on politics. And one of the things that I find hard to explain to people is the uh, point that only about 5% of House seats are actually competitive in any way. And what I'm looking for is a book recommendation because I've been using uh, this by David Pepper. I don't know if you can read it, yeah, but it's- Laboratories uh, of Autocracy. Yeah, the Laboratories of Autocracy. And to me, that's the, the best book I've been able to recommend to people about the importance of state houses. And I'm not looking for an academic book. Is there another book you would recommend accessible, you know, generally readable by most people that would help explain that? Well, uh, not that immediately comes to mind, but since we have a minute, let's go back to that issue. So in our lifetimes, you could argue, uh, some of our lifetimes, you could argue in the 50s, 60s, we might have had as many as 70 swing districts. Though your 5% is too low. That would mean there's 22, 23 swing districts out of the 435 seats. And I think the 
it's provable that they're more than that. There certainly were in, in halfway through when, after we passed Obamacare because we lost 60 seats. So there had to be more seats in play. But the number of swing districts has reduced. And in addition to your uh, laboratories of autocracy, I would recommend reading in several different areas. First, of course, the, the politics of state legislatures uh, doing gerrymandering uh, is very much in play. And there has been some movement, as you undoubtedly know, where some states are passing initiatives or otherwise reforming uh, the districting process. And I think that's meaningful. And the more they do that, the, the less the parties have the final say, uh, the more swing districts we will have. And we, I would just observe uh, that in some states, quite notably Washington, it's a straight horse trade. And the reason why uh, the Susan Del Benny seat and the Denny Heck seat were created is they traded off for Reichert and they were supposed to get a safe seat out of Bellevue to the east. That's the seat that Susan, that Kim Schreier now holds. So there's, that's three Democrats, three Republicans name a chair. So uh, the first area of reading would be uh, about uh, how to establish uh, 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 different kinds of ways to draw congressional districts over 10 years. May I circle back to my question? If I can circle back to my question, Pepper actually goes into all of that. Okay, uh -huh. he does a decent job of going into all of that. Uh -huh. I recommend books to people and I can often persuade people to read one book a year. Uh -huh. So what I'm saying is that when you're looking for the one book a year for people who don't uh -huh. love to read and want to get educated about that, is there a better single accessible book than that one that I might recommend? That's all I'm asking. Uh, okay. Not about the uh, wide scope of reading. OK, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. No, I don't have a better recommendation. Thank you. I would just commend to you, in addition to state legislatures and redistricting to look at ranked choice voting movements and see what you think about it because that's a whole different fish kettle and and uh, so, um, so laboratories of autocracy reinventing American democracy for the 21st century now this is different this is different I'm, I'm saying that the, this book, um, is a product that uh, of work by the American Academy in Arts and Sciences, head, uh -huh. headed up by uh, Professor Nelson at Harvard, where they go into the various remedies that should be undertaken. It's uh -huh. slender and it's free, and you can order six copies of it if you want and give them to five other people. Do you know so, what? Go on the uh, chat and give us the titles of both, and people will take them down. You, you see where that is on your screen? Yeah, I know how to do that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to go thank ahead you. and stop talking and go on to chat. Okay? What's the second title besides Laboratories of Autocracy? Um, there was a project sponsored by the American Academy mm -hmm. of Arts and Sciences that was headed up by a Harvard professor who, who's kind of big on the talk show circuits about what can we do to restore democracy. So they're looking beyond the work of like uh, George Putnam and the upswing, and they're looking beyond, uh, you know, um, the uh, How Democracies Die authors, their newest book, The Tyranny of the Minority. What they're trying to do is put together a package for people to understand the sort of legwork, groundwork, basic work that might reconstruct democracy. And the title of that one is called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century. And if you look on online for it, um, they give them out at the website. You can download a PDF or you can simply uh, submit a request and they'll mail you. I asked for a half dozen and then gave you know a bunch away. So I'll put both in the chat and I'll stop okay. talking. OK, thank you very much. So I'm pretty encouraged by some of the reform efforts, and, uh, but we have a long way to go. And uh, Derek Kilmer, some of you know, said, um, back when he was not resigned himself, uh, he was having, it went on a field trip with some Republican House members. And he said, well, let's work together on this issue we just 
figured out by visiting military bases. And the guy he was having dinner with said, you don't understand. I was elected by promising to never work with you. So that's the system we've got. And uh, in a lot of those elections, that position of intransigency is rewarded rather than uh, uh, discouraged. And that's why we only have 30 or 40 swing seats. It, it does fall to people who want a different democracy to win those 40 seats, of course. Um, last topic. Um, oh, uh, can I ask? Yes. I, I, for me, it just seems like there's so many resignations. It's historically, I no, mean- It's a little bit more. Uh, I mean, it's not, you know, in the 15 years or so, I was more involved in DC. It was more fun than this, uh, for sure. Uh, I ran a coalition for a while that was Democrats and Republicans. They liked each other. I think uh, it's awful right now, especially in the House. And uh, I don't see an immediate solution, uh, but I don't, I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think we're, I'm not with a description of our present situation as an autocracy, but I, I, I think we're in trouble for sure. Let's yeah. fix it. Okay. I think we need a new generation of leaders. I'd be a lot happier if everybody running for president or for Senate was 50 yeah. rather than 81 and 78. Amen, um, brother. Uh, so now, uh, uh, um, we're reducing the number of candidates on the House side. Maybe we're expanding them on the Senate. On the, I mean, the, on, I'm sorry, on the Republican side. Maybe we're expanding them on the Democratic side. So I think uh, obviously what's going to happen is uh, is uh, Haley or DeSantis will survive and. Uh, DeSantis, I think, is meaningfully to the right of Haley. So I'd personally rather see Haley survive. When you see those national polls about Trump having 60%, those are absolutely useless. I wish they would stop terrifying my sweetheart when we're watching the news. The polls that matter right now are in Iowa and New Hampshire. And Trump's rolling along about 45 or so in New Hampshire with Haley at like 22 and DeSantis at 16. That's much more interesting. If Trump can be held significantly under 50% in Iowa and New Hampshire, it's actually not a disadvantage to have both DeSantis and Haley be in for a while longer because some of those DeSantis votes go, uh, not insignificant number of those DeSantis votes go for Trump. So what you're hoping is for, uh, this not to be a foregone conclusion. And remember that most of the Republican primaries are after the trial, the Jack Smith trial, first Jack Smith trial begins on March 4th in, in DC on, uh, on electoral fraud. So um, I think it's common to say, none of this stuff over prosecutions and such affect Trump's support. It's just not true. Um, I think what is true is Trump's got a pretty firm base. But if you look at the polls of people who are for Trump in Iowa and New Hampshire, a good half of them are open to other candidates. And uh, every felonious thing done or every statement about how he hates Obamacare or wouldn't by being a dictator for the first day. Don't fall don't fall asleep on that. And think none of it matters. It all matters. It just doesn't matter as much as you want it to. That's basically what's happening. Um, Trump adding Obamacare as his list of hates is great. We've been wanting a list of things that are strengths. The economy, although Joe's not fully recognized for it. Uh, choice, our monster value added ticket for next year. Demographic changes are all to uh, our favor. Um, the Republican opposition to Trump is much more obvious than it was four years ago, hugely more obvious. 
the surviving Koch brother being the newest example. So uh, there will be, it's not going to just fall like a house cards. It's There will be a second, a runner up, uh, somebody placing second and the field will eventually clear. And the odds are that that will be Nikki Haley. Uh, whether she's Trump recedes as much as some of us wish he would will remain to be seen. It's not inevitable, but it's not inevitable that Trump be the candidate. And I don't think it's inevitable that uh, Joe Biden will be the candidate. I thought it was amazing the other day that he said he probably, he might well not be running if, uh, if uh, Donald Trump were not running. So now we've got an 81 year old man who is visibly deteriorating, who some of us think has done a wonderful job. And this morning, his son is, is indicted, charged with major federal income tax evasion. This is just, it's too much. You know what the Republican argument will be. They'll try and normalize Trump's misbehavior by, by talking about Hunter Biden. This is all too much. What it was interesting that happened this week is what Gavin Newsom did by debating DeSantis. That's so strange. Uh, so he did all right in defending Biden, but he it had the effect of giving him an advanced position if something happens to Biden or if Biden doesn't run. So if you're handlers for Josh Shapiro in, in Pennsylvania, who wants to be president, or Amy Klobuchar, Klobuchar who wants to be president, uh, Pete Buttigieg, um, Gret Gretchen Whitmer, you're saying, you don't want Gavin Newsom out there doing that. And interestingly, Gazim, Gavin Newsom says, well, I'm from California. I, I yield to Kamala Harris, which he doesn't, but he pretends to. So it should be interesting uh, if we see in the next couple months a more concerted effort to get Joe to be done, or if Joe has that in his heart or something happens to Joe, it's not going to be, oh, well, Kamala, you're vice president, it's yours. It'll be a wild west of campaigns and all those people I named would be, oh, Pritzker, the governor of Illinois. So it'll be wild for a while. But Gavin Newsom has name ID. I'm, I'm not saying he wouldn't be a significant candidate. And I don't know what the vice president would do. I do think that there's a significant possibility that neither Trump nor Joe Biden will be the presidential candidates. And if that happens, this will be quite a year. And that's my third. Amelie. Questions, thoughts, and concerns on any of these things? I just, I just saw Dave Henry had uh, made a noise. Do you have something you want to say, Dave? Or? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I was looking for somebody who has a read on the truth behind Kilmer deciding not to go on. I talked to uh, I haven't seen Christine Rothless. I talked to Phil Rockefeller about it and and a couple other people. Maybe Kilbane has something to say. I I don't know, but his kids are older. He was gonna come home because of his kids. He needed to do it two, three terms ago go because then, you know, it was back breaking schedule. It's strange. I think, you know, Derek's too young not to have something else in mind. I don't know what it is. As you know, you can't run for Senate. Um, uh, it's interesting now, uh, Emily Randall's in that race, so it's Hillary France. It's not going to be by herself. But uh, I I don't know. I know him, but I he didn't. You know, he's, he's not calling me to tell him what, what he's doing. I don't know. But certainly the people I've talked to who know Derek think there's something else besides being tired of, you know, he has been tired of the Republicans for a long time. So I think something else is going on and that we'll eventually know. 
It's too bad. He is exactly the kind of person we need to stay. I can't imagine a congressman who we should more, want more to stay than Derek. It's awful. I agree. I just, my read of him is this is something important out of the blue. And yeah. I think it's important to the Democratic Party to understand how this worked. Well, I mean, it could be something intensely personal, too. Uh, 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 you know, it takes a long time to, to uh, you know, years ago, uh, you wondered whether uh, either Patty or Maria would ever get enough seniority in the, the, in the Senate to be like it used to be with Scoop and Maggie and Henry Jackson and Warren Magnuson. And they have. I mean, Maria's chair of the Commerce Committee and Patty's uh, appropriations. So uh, I think uh, uh, we what we should want in the House is increase seniority beyond Adam Smith, who's chair of armed services, and our hope for a growing leader to be in leadership, maybe not a committee chair, maybe even eventually speaker would have been Derek. This is too bad. So I have a couple of questions about things that have Karen, did you want to say something? I'm sorry if I'm uh uh that uh one, Robert Kaplan wrote a couple of fiery editorials in the Washington Post about how um this is this is basically the um the the nightmare before the before fascism that we are on the cusp of uh the end of democracy you started this conversation by saying you have faith in our institutions and government and that we're going to survive this uh have you have you read either of Kaplan's pieces, and do you have any response to them? No, I think uh, yeah, I read them. I think uh, I just think that that line of thinking cherry picks the worst maltiness of Donald Trump and and makes it into policy. Even last time, for the awful ideas he had. Uh, the Supreme Court was a check on him. Congress was a check on him. I'm not saying it wouldn't be awful uh, if he was elected, but I think uh, using the word fascism, con considering Hitler killed 8 million Jews and a hell of a lot of other people, it is ill-advised for Americans to throw out those labels every time uh, we've uh, connect with the America's right wing. So, I mean, I I know our, a lot of those very conservative members, you know, believe in the same constitution that we have. The, I just think it's irresponsible to talk about a dictatorship right when we're having uh, felony trials for abuse of the election process. Uh, plus, I think, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm, 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 I'm not a big fan of the Supreme Court, but I think when it comes to, you know, there are 50-some legal challenges by Trump. How many of them were successful? I, I just think uh, uh, liberals, progressives, uh, uh, I, it's, it's, it's all right to be scared by scary people. I just have more faith in America than Kaplan does. Yeah. One of the things that uh, that also was came out, I, re I remember with the January 6th commission was how many of those rank and file Republicans refused to go along with Trump uh, when the requests were beyond the pale. And of course we have, we have uh, Liz Cheney as exhibit number one for uh, people who are not going to put up with it anymore, even at personal cost. And she got a lot of attention this week as well. Any thoughts about her? Well, I think Liz Cheney, like John Huntsman and Larry Hogan and Joe Manchin, would only be a third party candidate if they could guarantee to themselves that they weren't going to help Trump win. And for that reason, it's still just talk. 
Liz Cheney would get more Democratic votes than Republicans, even though her voting record was extremely conservative. I mean, there was a reason she was a part of leadership. She was not, it, it was, it came, it was really the insurrection that changed her. And remember, she's Dick Cheney's uh, daughter, and Trump has spent a whole part of his life flipping off Dick Cheney and George W. Bush. So there's that, that aggravation on Steve, but I don't doubt that she believes that America is a great threat and she's pledged to do everything she can to keep the worst from happening. Um, I think what happened is uh, it was an unforced error. I think the even on January 3rd or January 4th, right before the insurrection, if enough Demo Republicans had said, this election is over, I think things would have gone a lot better. We were dying in December and January for someone to say this uh, was a fraud. And what was happening is Republicans who would whisper that were being told by Trump that he was gonna kill him. And, and so they didn't have the guts, I think to this day, they picked political expediency over the nation's best interests. And if they had done that, you know, John Thune said in March, the election was over. They were a little late. They allowed this whole set of lies to prosper for a long time. It's too bad. It's too bad for the 8,000 or that's not that many. The, the insurrectionists who believed all this shit you know, because they're the ones spending time in jail. Well, that's exactly why I have no respect for the Republican Party at all. Well, you know, I I worked, I I you know I known Dan Evans a little bit. I worked for a Republican governor, and I was always a Democrat. But I you know I think there's been a healthy share of really awful Democratic election office holders too. But lately. Well, I get that. But lately, it's it's not been a pretty sight. Remember yeah. that elected officials try and survive. They want to continue to serve. But not right now, but uh, self-preservation is a huge instinct. So you look at Chris Christie, who's now sees himself as a big uh, Trump truth teller. Chris Christie was, Chris Christie was, kissing Trump's hems, the hem of Trump's garments day after day for years. So yeah. even when Trump called him a fat man on TV, said he should watch his eating, the, the amount of humility, humiliation that Republicans were willing to go through so they could get the Supreme Court is, you, know, you look at Mitch, Mitch hates Trump. <laughs> he won't talk to him. Uh, so it's, it's just awful. But remember, in all those, in a lot of those hearts is a desire to have some kind of America that we can all respect. So I think there's a fundamental difference between uh, what uh, Republicans, at least establishment Republicans, are willing to do now than they were four years ago. Yeah. Over Oh, go, uh, a couple months ago, I remember I brought I brought up Gavin Newsom as possibly being a Democratic uh, presidential candidate. Yeah, and I poo pooed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I it's interesting because the reason why he ended up talking with DeSantis is DeSantis didn't DeSantis talk some smack about him? Yeah, and, but, then, and then Gavin goes, "Hey, come on, bring it on." Yeah, That's but I think day. Gavin Newsom knows it puts him in a different place. If Trump does, if Biden doesn't run, right. I think it was brilliant politically to manufacture a reason for a debate that Joe Biden wouldn't reject. Yeah. And I think it does put him in an interesting place if Biden were not to run. Yeah, I he, think it was a very cunning move. Yeah, it was. And he's kind of a, you know, he's kind of a rough talking little bit macho guy that I think could have appealed to maybe some people on the other side of the I think I there's I think there's a minus three percent for being from California. That's what. Uh, well, is. that's true. California. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Anyway. 
Sheila. David, when do you think, um, do you have any kind of prognostication as to when this will be firmed up as to whether Trump and or Biden run? Well, if, if Trump, so I, um, Super Tuesday is in late March or early April, so I think you'll know a lot more. I think if Biden's not going to run, he'll be, you'll know by the end of January. And if Trump's not going to succeed, you'll know by April. Okay, thank you. If it's Biden versus Trump, you'll know for sure that that's going to happen in April or May, unless one of them has a heart attack after that. Or we will. So I was a little choppy today, but thank you. And thank you, Michael, for the, the two books. Um, I'll read the first one first. And uh, I think we've got, a, got plenty to worry about. I'm just, uh, let's go back to, you, to not thinking of the opposition that's fascist would be good, I think. Thank you for responding to that. Do you have a final thought, Michael? I'd like to throw one thing out. I'm I'm not fond of um, overuse of the label fascist, but I am very concerned about a country that's sort of seeming to me to slow walk towards the Orban Hungary sort of model of performative democracy, where the the customs are there. You have an election, but things are structured in such a way that you know it's somewhat predetermined. And one of the things I'm concerned about is I had connections with uh, the Republican Party in the, the day of, um, you know, Howard Baker, um, you know, people like that, you know, Watergate era people. And it was a very different party. There's a, a wonderful, to me, a wonderful book by Jeffrey Kabaservice, K-A-B-A-S-E-R-V-I-C-E, who was a Republican insider who wrote a very long book, which it's, I think it's extremely informative, called Rule and Ruin, in which he looks at how the Republican Party has over time eliminated moderates, eliminated moderation, and how that occurred. And he looks back to the earlier era when it was, in fact, moderate Republicans who helped pass major legislation in civil rights, environmental law, and many other things. But then he traces forward the way that people like that have basically been run out of the party. And wow. um, David, with all due respect, when you talk about guardrails that existed in perhaps 2016 through 2020 and after that, those guardrails are dependent upon having people in the Republican Party who are willing to recognize guardrails. And my That's concern wrong. is that... Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking. Go ahead. No, I, I, I lived that. I worked for the uh, Dan Evans, Nelson Rockefeller style governor of Michigan, Bill Milliken. And I was around when Howard Baker called him and pleaded with those moderate Republican governors for support when he was trying to get the nomination over Reagan. I mean, over uh, Danny Bush. And those governors, some of them, Patricia, believed that Danny Bush was was going to uh, be fine. And then Reagan beat him. And those moderate go governors lost their parties right then. And the hell of it is the people they lost it to, uh, basically Reagan Republicans, were killed by Tea Party Republicans who have subsequently been killed by, by in some of these states, by really by people significantly to the right of that. I don't, don't know that the guardrails are gone. And someone like John Thune, who's going to replace McConnell, I think he's a guardrail kind of guy. So I'm not sure that so far that it, it, that uh, analogy is is Hungary or Argentina. We'll find out, won't we? Well, we've used up the hour, and I thank you as always, David. And the book group that Michael was talking about is called Not Your Typical Book Group. I think that was at least one of the book groups he's part of, which is coordinated by uh, Chris Ann here at the Senior Community Center. Send us a note if you want to get on her list to possibly join. And David, uh, we'll see you next month and yeah. with better news, we hope. Yeah, thanks a lot.